Good morning. It's Monday, July 17th, 2023. I'm Russell, and this is Rocky Road Devotions, a few minutes of help for today's journey. Our devotion today is entitled, To Conceive or Not to Conceive, a Conundrum in an Overly Sexualized Culture. Our scripture is Job chapter 10, verse 10. You guided my conception and formed me in the womb. And Psalm 139, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. And then Ecclesiastes chapter 11, Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. And lastly, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. The recent decision of the Supreme Court of the United States to overturn Roe v. Wade and the ensuing public debate over abortion once again stir the division between left-wing and right-wing political factions. At the risk of further polarization, I offer something of a contribution, not from a denominationally mandated, politically connected viewpoint, simply an interface of God's Word with commitment to truth-telling meant for the hard decisions of everyday life. We live in that kind of world. Pragmatism confronts our surrender to Holy Scripture, and we must respond. The debate ongoing in history and greatly inflamed on January 2, 1973, when Roe v. Wade, the decision to quote-unquote legalize abortion, was passed, this debate has widened the chasm between left and right politically and largely ignored the underlying divide that is the preceding cause of abortion, which could have been avoided. To wit, we don't follow God's word, and we end up in this mess, blaming each other with the greatest harm being done to the unborn. Now much of what follows in this message is excerpted from an article published October the 8th, 2021 in Perspective Magazine, a production of Good News. And I quote, There seems to be broad consensus that what exists within the womb is alive. After all, it is growing and developing and even has a detectable heartbeat by the sixth week of pregnancy. Some would say that a fetus is simply part of a woman's body. Having an abortion for some is the moral equivalent of removing a tumor or having a plastic surgery. Against this view is the fact that a fetus has different DNA than its mother. If the fetus were simply part of the woman's body, it would have the same identical DNA as the mother. But of course, the fetus has both the mother's and father's DNA, combined in a new and unique way, so it has a distinct life from that of the mother. Ultrasound technology shows us that a fetus has a life and existence of its own. When it comes to the baby in the womb, the mother is dealing with a separate new life, which takes the question into a different moral category. As reported by Emma Green in The Atlantic, activist Ashley McGuire recounts her own experience of pregnancy. Quote, when you're seeing a baby sucking its thumb at 18 weeks, smiling, clapping, it becomes harder to square the idea that that 20-week-old, that unborn baby or fetus, is discardable. End of quote. Now, that's some, not nearly all, of the content of the debate, which, if conducted honestly, always includes three things, science, faith, and emotional response. What follows is a longer amalgam of the cause of why this debate, in my view, should be ended and can be ended. Quoting once again Good News magazine, This is where our overly sexualized culture does women a disservice. Women are often expected to engage in sexual relations without any form of commitment by the man. Yet, Women are the ones who bear the consequences in terms of pregnancy. This is fundamentally unjust. But the answer is not to do away with the consequences by ending the pregnancy. 
Rather, the answer is to return to God's plan for how we experience our sexual relationships. God designed sexual relationships to be experienced within the context of marriage, which represents a commitment by the man to care and provide for his wife and any offspring that might be conceived. Without that commitment, women and children are left unprotected and not provided for. An irresponsible man simply expects the woman to have an abortion to eliminate the consequences of his irresponsibility. Biblical theology teaches that men and women should reserve sex until marriage. This protects the woman from being taken advantage of and it prevents the vast majority of potential abortions by reserving pregnancy and childbirth to the safety of marriage, where both the woman and her child are provided for. The CDC reports that 85% of abortions are obtained by unmarried women. This approach to sexuality is countercultural. Jesus and the apostles consistently invite us to live by a different set of values and assumptions than our culture does. Such an approach also avoids the emotional pain, emptiness, and even the physical consequences of promiscuity. It is the healthiest way to live. End of quote. And now we present the call to live the life which God intends for our blessing. Quoting once again Good News Magazine, quote, Biblically, life is a gift of God. God creates life and expects us to be good stewards of the life we're given. While the mother and father play a crucial role in bringing new life into the world, ultimately God is the one who forms life in the womb, Psalm 139. Children are a gift from God, Psalm 127. His purpose for our life dates back before our birth, Jeremiah 1.5. God loves and values unborn children. The issues around abortion are painful ones to wrestle with, and there are no easy answers. We can prayerfully consider how God would want to use the challenging circumstances in which we find ourselves for our good, for the good of others, and His glory. We do not want to close the door on the possibility of miraculously answered prayer. At the same time, women with undesired pregnancies provide an opportunity for the body of Christ to come around them with love and support that would make that pregnancy manageable. We ought to be the hands and feet of Jesus in serving women and their unborn children with love and acceptance. Often, that support needs to continue past the birth and through the baby's childhood, particularly for single mothers and women in poverty. The church's pro-life ethic is not just during pregnancy, but extends through all of life. For you today, the debate and level of emotions run deeper and much broader than these few pages of thoughts, primarily from the faith-centered pro-life position. But these few things seem to be the most important issues upon which Christians cannot afford to abandon. Number one, we have a mandate to protect life at any stage, in vitro or ex, and that includes the mother, Christian believer or not. And number two, part of protecting and caring is found in listening. To simply trumpet pro-life platitudes won't cut it for a single mom at three in the morning when she's only had two hours of sleep, the bills are unpaid, and her full-time job with two other part-time things won't even cover child care and rent. For our final word today, let's listen to Mother Teresa as she accepted the 1979 Nobel Peace Prize for her work with children worldwide. Quote, Abortion has become the greatest destroyer of peace because it destroys two lives, the life of the child and the conscience of the mother. P.S. This has come closer to a full-size sermon rather than a five-minute devotional, but the issue here is too important. I've also not preached in the last two weeks since I retired, so thanks for listening. I'm tempted to ask if any church needs a supply preacher next week, but I wouldn't do that. 
I do eagerly encourage you to read the Good News article in its entirety. It is a kind, well-presented, and scripture-based call to the church to embrace God's will for his body, to be like Jesus, who came that we might have life, and that more abundantly. You chew on that as you hit the rocky road. Have a blessed day.